Okay, good afternoon. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I was going to give a long and detailed introduction and tutorial to my work here. Then I noticed I have only 10 minutes. So let's get right to it. Uh, I'm an astrophysicist, though I'm now a computer scientist working with astrophysicists. We explode stars and we use large computers for that. Up there, that's a picture of Blue Waters. That's one of the fastest machines available in the States. It has about 300,000 cores. And uh, we run simulations on there. For example, up there is a picture of a simulation where we studied where we studied the magnetic field as it develops in a core collapse supernova. And this simulation used about 20 million core hours. And you can imagine that these are also expensive if you imagine a few cents per core hours or something. So that's a non-trivial amount of computation. And uh, obviously, these machines are difficult and complicated to use. Currently, our code base uses C++, Fortran, some Mathematica code to generate C++ code, and so on. And my hope is that at some point, Julia will be able to replace all that in a way that is much easier to use and also faster. But today, I want to talk about high-performance computing. And for me, that is distributed memory computing. So let me outline the problem before I talk about the solution. If you keep the problem in mind and not my approach to a solution, that's already good enough for this talk. The question is, how do you scale to 300,000 cores or to 10,000 nodes? Shared array that you might know does not work because these are not shared memory machines. It's distributed memory. So multi-threading and shared memory does not work. Distributed array would work, does work beautifully, but most of the time, if you have large simulations, you're going to use complicated algorithms. And something like a matrix or uniform array is not good enough. You have multiple blocks in the simulation domain, and uh, we have a tree structure that adaptive mesh refinement. Parts of the domain are more expensive than other parts, so just chunking up the domain into equal sized blocks that is not going to be efficient. And there are much more problems. Uh, but more severe problems, for example, simply running Julia minus P 300,000, as nice as it would look like, will not work for various reasons. Things just don't scale, can't scale to that. So I'm not even going to talk about that. This minus P is a beautiful thing. It's one of the things that convinced me that Julia is a good language because it is very good for the beginner, for simple problems. But at the high end, you have to put much more effort into it. So the gold standard of high performance computing is MPI. If you're not familiar with it, MPI is a message passing interface. It's a standard. There exist several lib uh, implementations, libraries. And what it does, it allows you to send messages between processes. And it's uh, very efficient and also rather low level. The receiver needs to know when someone is going to send a message, who is going to send the message, and how large it is so that you can allocate the receive buffer ahead of time. And uh, most HPC codes are written using MPI. Uh, but it's really tedious and low level, and that, that restricts the kind of algorithms that you can handle I mean, from a software uh, engineering point of view. So let's look at some of these distributed memory systems. That's a system, Shilop at LSU, where I did some measurements and then rounded the numbers to one digits. You all know the memory hierarchy that caches are faster, have a higher bandwidth and much smaller latency. And there's the main memory there with 100 nanoseconds and about 10 gigabytes per second or something. That machine, I think, had 64 gigabytes of RAM. And then if you take all the nodes together and look at the latency and the bandwidth of the interconnect, you, you wonder, why can't I why can't I treat this simply like a shared memory? So main memory is only usable because of the caches. If you read something from main memory, it's very slow, but then you're using it again, the same numbers, and you're using neighboring numbers that are pulled in via the, because they live in the same cache line, and then the amortized latency is quite low, makes it usable. The question is, why can't you do that with a large distributed memory system? Remote direct memory access is supported by InfiniBand, probably by expensive Ethernet cards as well. And even the caching, you could do it in software, 3,000 nanoseconds. You can access a dictionary or something in software. That would work beautifully. The problem is that you can't have a coherent cache efficiently. If you have something in cached and you want to modify it, then, of course, other processes might also have it cached. And then you need to tell them that the value changed. And what happens if two processes want to mo modify the same value at the same time? One of them has to be first, a lot of communication in between. And you can't do that efficiently. It's even expensive if you do it in a single node. A lot of chip bandwidth within the motherboard is, is used up by that. But in large system, it simply doesn't work. You can't do efficient cache coherent simulations. And that means you need locking and all these other complicated mechanisms that make this uh, distributed memory computing so complicated. And the root of all evil, well, it's premature optimization. We heard that this morning. 
but uh, it's also shared mutable state. If you have, uh, let's look at the first row that's single threaded. If you have an immutable data structure, of course you can access it. If you have a mutable read write data structure, you can also access it. There are no locks or atomics or anything because you have just a single thread that's efficient. Let's look at the first column. If you have immutable data, then it doesn't matter whether you have one or multiple threads. Multiple threads can read only access the same data structure efficiently. You can copy it and cache it. It, it works beautifully as well. But the problem appears if you have a shared mutable state, if you have a data structure that changes and multiple threads want to read or write it at the same time. And the, the solution that I'm going to advertise today is uh, don't do that. Just don't do that. Restructure your programs, restructure your brain, and then restructure your programs to be able to avoid that. And, and I tried it, it's possible, but it, it requires a bit of a brain gymnastics. So I want to compare this shared mutable state with, for example, global constants versus global variables. If you have a function calling another function and the function accesses a global variable, and then after that function call, you don't know what the other function did to the global variable, whether it has changed or it's expensive, you, you can't cache the value and the function can't keep it on the stack and so on. Or the same garbage collection via reference counting. Reference counting has this this air of being quite fast, but in a multi-threaded system, each time you increase or decrease the reference, you actually have to use an atomic operation, and that, that is actually quite expensive. It takes many nanoseconds to do that. Garbage collection, you think it's slow, but you never need to care about memory uh, reference counting, so every time you access an object or copy it, it's really, really fast. So in principle, when it comes to parallel computing, constants and, and, and garbage collection is actually faster than what I highlighted there in red. So let's get to the to the meat of my talk, to the center point. This is what I want to suggest uh, for high performance computing, functional high performance computing. And the ideas that I'm presenting here, they are not new. They have existed in the high performance community when the computer science part and the, the software engineers who actually run the programs haven't quite caught up yet. But these ideas have certainly been around for 10 years. I mean, in, in the application side and they must have been popped up in a more esoteric research a long time before that. The basic idea is when you have an object, anything that you allocate or something, you split the lifetime into two parts. In the beginning, the object is private. Private means only one thread knows about it, and then you can read it and write it and then do whatever you want. And then you tell other threads about that object, and from that instant on, the object needs to be immutable. You don't modify it anymore. And then you completely avoid shared mutable state. And once the, as long as the, pro, the object is uh, accessible only by one thread. You can use all your for loops and mutating things in the same programming style that you used to to initialize the object. But at some point, you need to stop modifying it and keep it immutable. There are no language constructs in Julia to enforce that, so it's just a convention. But if you actually look, there are no language constructs to enforce that in C and C++ either. What they call const isn't the same as immutable in Julia, and there are too many ways around that. Mm. And this naturally meshes with futures and asynchronous execution and other constructs that already exist in Julia. It's a bit, bit messy, sorry to say that, because there are tasks which are not really parallel and there's threading that's currently being implemented and then there's distributed computing and I think the API could require, could, could use a bit of a cleanup there. But the basic idea for all of this is of course already there, except the distinction between mutating and non-mutating, between private and shared, these ideas are not yet clearly present. And if you can make these ideas clear, then high-performance computing, distributed computing, becomes much simpler, safer, and more efficient. So I have developed a prototype called Fun HPC. Of course, the pun is intended for functional high-performance computing. I've implemented something in C++ that is much further ahead, that is quite usable. In Julia, it's still a prototype because there, there are various issues with tasking and MPI and, and, and and multi-threading and so on that are not fleshed out yet, but in principle, it works. So the basic idea here is that you have, you might have heard of that already, PGAS, which is a parallel, sorry, partitioned global address space. A global address space means you have, although it's distributed memory on each process, you have a way to talk about objects living in the other memory space. You can have references to remote objects. But although you have references, you cannot directly access them. You might need to do some copying or something explicit. That means you can freely talk about all the other project objects that exist, but the difference between something that is local and efficient and something that might be remote, that difference is still explicitly present in the source code. And that seems to be 
uh, necessary for efficiency. There, of course, have been approaches to try to completely hide the difference between local and global objects, uh, treating everything as a large shared memory system. And I think these approaches have by now clearly all failed. And what I do in this fun HPC project, I essentially define types and functions that are similar to remote ref and spawn and pmap. So my work started early in Julia 0.4. Julia 0.5 has by now caught up with these things a bit. And there's some infrastructure also to, that replicates some infrastructure in base to make it possible to experiment with things without having to modify base. And for example, there's a cluster manager in base that is, I don't know, several hundred lines of code. And then if you take out the things you don't need for HPC computing, then it's just condensed to 20 lines of code requiring MPI. Mm. And I want to give you an example. I was going to show you something. I did something really stupid. Bef in the week before the conference, I tried to update it to Julia 0.5. And now I have something that, <laughs> due to, uh, yeah, it's highly embarrassing. Never happened to me before. <laughs> that actually currently doesn't run. So you can't run something, but I have some code here. And if there's a is there laser pointer here, that looks like a pointer. Like this? Yeah. Okay. Is it visible? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the idea is that, for example, you have a simulation domain and you split it up into blocks. Each block is a small block that you handle on a single thread. That is that what I call block here. And then you have a domain, and the domain is then a vector of these fun ref, that's essentially a remote reference to these blocks. So the domain is an object that lives on one process, and then it can point to all the blocks that are distributed over the simulation domain. And if you have 100 processes, then you have 1,000 or 10,000 or a million of these blocks. It's, it's not one block per domain, but you rather have many, many of these, and they can also be copied between the processes as need. And then if you have a smoothing function, then you have a smoothing function for a single block, which is just the regular serial optimized smoothing code. And if you have a smoothing function for a domain, then you essentially need to something that maps over the vector and that maps over this reference and then calls the smoothing function here for the individual block and something with boundary conditions. And I found it telling that I realized that I needed to introduce something like fmap stencil, which is essentially equivalent to the run stencil function that we heard earlier. So that, that seems to be an abstraction that is kind of useful for parallel computing and uh, does something useful. Mm. So I don't want to spend too much time with the code. I don't want to give a tutorial here, but I want to, can't, not too much time. So the name of the game in uh, distributed computing, if you have irregular data structures, is you need to hide the latency. Because uh, we heard that, I believe it was yesterday or the day before, that clock speed is not going to go up. That also means that the communication speed, the latency, is not going to go faster. If you communicate between two process, between two nodes, it's just going to take uh, microseconds, maybe it goes down a bit, but it will not go down to nanoseconds. So you need to hide the latency, and the way to do that, you have many threads running. If you have 100 cores, you might have 10,000 or a million threads, even on a laptop. And then if one of them needs to wait for a communication, you run something else. That might just begin to communicate, and then you move on to the next one, and so on and so forth. So the basic question is, you need to find enough parallelism in your application to handle that. and. Uh, a few other remarks. What that means, memory allocation is good. Uh, if you look at the add time command, it tells you in Julia how fast something runs, and that it also tells you how much many bytes you allocated, uh, implying that allocating is bad and is slow. It is not. If you allocate some memory, then it's, it's a secret region that only you know about. And you can use it at your heart's content, and you don't need to worry about conflicting with other threads. So in parallel programming, allocating a new piece of memory is actually good. It, it creates parallelism and performance. And the other problem is that serial code has actually warped people's mind. If you write down a mathematical algorithm on a table, you write xn plus 1 equals some function of xn. And the natural representation of xn, of course, is an array. But if you write it in a piece of code, they say, well, we need to use uh, x current and x previous, double buffering, and so on, which was in your example as well. So in my, my code, I use fmap, but I don't use double buffering. Instead, I allocate new memory. Of course, if you allocate too much memory, it, it's still slow again. But there are many ways where people have learned to write serial code and automatically, even unconsciously, optimize code. And you need to avoid that if you want to run efficiently. 
For example, don't reuse buffers or don't look for an optimum execution order as in, the, as in the previous talk, because the optimum execution order in parallel, of course, is do everything at once. And if you try to find an optimum order, then you might just prevent things from running at once, running simultaneously. Also, saving memory is not necessary. If you run on 10,000 nodes, say, if you have a problem, you run on 1,000 nodes and you're running out of memory, you can just upgrade to 10,000 nodes and then you're using only 10% of the available memory. So memory is much less of a problem than when you're running on a single node. On a single node, then the memory limits uh, the problem size that you can run. But when you do parallel computing, it's not the amount of memory, it, it's the amount of parallelism that you find in your application. I think I've been talking for too long, so let me skip the next slide and just think about the next steps that I should do, we should do, one should do. I think the distributed computing uh, API in Bayes, the mechanisms for that, they, they, they could serve a clean up. I'm not saying it needs to be done before one point out, but at some point things could or maybe should be rearranged, just naming functions and making sure that various concepts are orthogonal. Uh, regarding this fun HPC, I need to implement a few examples, some applications, measure performance, ensure that things work nicely, and then come up with a tutorial and then uh, change people's mind. Because parallel programming is not so much about uh, writing something, but about algorithm design, designing things, and trying to avoid the shared mutable state, which then makes parallelism much more natural. I mentioned before, the ideas that I presented here are not new, but I think they need to be brought into Julia, and I've put up some uh, keywords from related work and other software packages where these ideas or part of these ideas have been used. Thank you. <coughs> <coughs>